Good morning. This is a great day for us because it's one of our, our most important academic days of the year because we're here to honor Dr. Greep. Welcome back, Randy. Um, as you guys know, Randy, we were having dinner last night and we were talking, and I think Lars said it better than anyone when he said that I, thought, I usually thought about Rushmore as four people, but Lars basically said that the field of aortic surgery really goes down to Stanley Crawford and Randall Greep. So there were only two people on that Mount Rushmore. So I believe that we have one of the, I think we could all agree we have back one of the fathers of the field. And more importantly, certainly to me, as we also stand in this room today or sit down and all of us and all the success we enjoy comes right back to this man because he really was the, the vision behind this department and really laid the foundation for us to keep building the house on. So it's always great, Randy, to have you back. And it's also fun for us to always have a Greek professor, Lars. And this year we have a very, very special one. Not only is he a very close friend, of mine and has been a super supporter of my career, but he also is you know, certainly one of the two or three most important cardiac surgeons in the world right now. Uh, Lars is the, runs the Cardiovascular Institute at Cleveland Clinic, has been the Cosgrove professor, professor, has been the director of their Aortic and Marfan Center, and also probably most importantly, as we were just talking over a cup of coffee, really was a visionary in the partner's trial, which really changed the field of aortic surgery. And he headed that publications committee, which now has put out over 100 publications just from that particular data set. So his impact in the field really can't be underestimated. So he's a very appropriate person to have here today to help us honor Dr. Greep. So Lars, I'm going to turn it over to you today. He's going to talk to us about to have our AVR surgery and, and root repair. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dave. It's a pleasure to be here with a friend and also a lot of other people I know and I've known over the years and especially being here for the Randy Greep lecture. Uh, I've known about Randy for many, many years and obviously having trained with Dr. Crawford and aortic surgery and had the benefit of that, I also followed very closely what uh, Randy was writing about uh, too. So it's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Julie was very much part of our original thinking about the partner trial too and so credit to her and we go back to Baylor and uh, Judy was there with Dr. DeBakey before my time. And so it's great to meet friends and people I've known for a long time. So thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, so I thought it'd be good to just talk about the aortic root and valves and particularly that area. I'm not gonna talk much about aortic surgery uh, outside of that realm. So just to... Uh, give you an sort of oversight of what we're looking at. This are the latest figures on expenditure in the United States and what we're spending money on. So diabetes leads at $100 billion a year. But if you take it as a group of diseases, cardiovascular disease is about $231 billion. And of that ischemic heart is a majority. But if you then look at the other areas that consume a lot of expense, it's really boiling a lot down to obesity. So backache is the third most expensive health care condition in the United States, apart from diabetes. And if you look at what's going to be happening over the next few years, if you look at the population at the bottom there on the left, over age of 65, that's going to be growing population with a distribution of diseases, but once again, the biggest category of disease is cardiovascular disease. So for <coughs> you young people are wondering about your future, I think it's pretty secure for the next 20, 30 years because of the demographics and what's happening with cardiovascular disease. So let me uh, cover several areas. I realize this is perhaps a bit of a long talk, but I'm going to follow these subjects. So just an overview of valve surgery at the Cleveland Clinic. 
So we do um, a lot of cases uh, for valves, and a few years ago, Dave and I worked on a guideline on aortic diseases, and particularly valves, and, and we put together this graph, which was on the left what was happening in centers around the country, and then the Cleveland Clinic on the right. And the volume certainly is increasing for AVR. AVR cabbage with a decline in coronary disease has gone down. Mitral valve repair has increased, and obviously here at Mount Sinai, a huge increase in mitral valve repairs. So we do about 6,600 cases a year, and about a quarter of those are thoracic. Our volume of cardiovascular surgery, um, and this is particularly cardiac and thoracic aorta, has remained pretty steady, about 4,500 a year. If you look at the breakdown of that, uh, cabbage surgery is a small fraction, and we used to be basically a cabbage factory. We were down to 13%, but we're seeing now an increase to 18%, and I think that's the effect of some of the trials, particularly treatment of diabetics. We do a lot of combined valves, and our percutaneous valve volume is increasing. And our outcomes overall for the entire breadth of cardiac surgery remains below the UHC numbers. And our patients come from 37% uh, outside the United States, and we have a, a small but very important fraction from outside the United States, so international patients, and they come from all over the world. If you look at our admissions for Heart and Vascular Institute, cardiothoracic surgery accounts for about 41% of that patient population. And financially, the Heart and Vascular Institute is a big drive of the finance of the entire Cleveland Clinic system. And this year, we'll probably create about $240 million in, um, in, the, in total uh, contribution to the hospital. So for valves, we do about 3,000 valves, and only about a third of those are isolated. Most of them are combinations with other procedures. And if you look at the valves, um, mitrals are about 12% uh, isolated and aortic about a quarter. Another way to look at it is how we do these operations, and about half are conventional uh, full stenotomies but we do a lot of min-invasive and less invasive procedures. For mitral valves, isolated is only about a third. Most of them are in combination with other procedures. And uh, I know you guys have had great results on your outcomes on mitral valves. And for the last three years, we haven't had a death uh, for a mitral valve repair. Aortic valves, um, just over a third are isolated. And this is just a volume. Um, over time, and I know a lot of institutions have seen a decline in aortic valves. At least we haven't seen a big change, but we seem to be seeing perhaps uh, some change in the reoperation numbers. The big change for us has been the increase in TAVR. We're now doing 50 a month, and uh, I fully expect that we'll probably be in the region of 400, 450 this year, which has created a huge problem for us. We have five hybrid rooms, and we're going to build another two to try and accommodate all the stuff that we're doing in the hybrid rooms. It's not just aortic valves, um, TAVARs, it's also endovascular, lead extractions, etc. And here are results uh, versus STS or UHC, and we, just <coughs> like you, focus very much on high quality care and great outcomes for our patients. And just like you, we have three star rankings uh, in those categories. Our aortic surgery, just to mention it, uh, Dave asked about it um, before, and uh, we do about 1,200 uh, to 1,250 uh, total aortic cases a year, and about 700 of those are in the thoracic aorta. So as we look at going forwards and what's going to drive what's going to happen in the United States is the aging population. The baby boomers for Ohio, we're going to see a huge increase in the elderly population, and we're already seeing them transition from good commercial insurance now over to Medicare, and then obviously a big growth in Medicaid, which has affected our financials and how we run the institution. <coughs> 
So as I mentioned for you who are younger, there's going to be great opportunity for you because the population over the age of 65 is going to grow by 93% over the next uh, 25 years. And the other part of this is the study from, by Nkormo um, from Mayo. And sorry, I, I used the Zulu pronunciation of that there. Nkormo means, just as an aside, uh, cattle. And uh, I've often chatted with him about that. But this is a very important study for you going forwards to understand what's happening in cardiovascular disease. And uh, that is that 12% of patients over the age of 75 with, will have valve disease. And so as you think about your future careers, a high priority should be valvular disease of the heart. Now, what's going to happen to inpatients versus outpatient is a fairly complex issue. This is a slide I put together um, about four years ago based on the best information I could put together. And basically, on the left, the population in the United States is going to grow by 20 to 25 percent over the next 10 years. But cardiac surgery will keep up with that. All other areas of in-hospital care are going to decline in cardiovascular <coughs> disease. But on the outpatient side, that's where you're going to see a huge growth. So 20 percent growth in population, but huge growth in EP studies, peripheral vascular disease, imaging, et cetera. So that's where the big change is going to be in healthcare too, and that is going to be outpatient care. <coughs> if you look at predictions for where the market's going to grow as far as devices, percutaneous, heart valve repair, not much growth, we've seen already that that's not worked out. It's the percutaneous valve heart replacements and surgical valve replacements where we're going to see a lot of growth. The prediction is the TAVOL volume will grow to about 25,000 a year and probably stabilize about that. But on the other hand, more recent analysis is looking at even 60, 70,000 uh, TAVOLs a year. And we'll touch a bit on that later. So what about aortic valves? We, in the paper that Dave and I put together on guidelines, we try to calculate and figure out how many valves are done in the United States open. And we came up with about 92,000 at a cost of half a billion. Now, why this is important, if we have full penetration of percutaneous aortic valves, that is going to grow to potentially four to six billion dollars and be somewhere in the region of two to three percent of Medicare's hospital uh, costs. Now, for most patients, we use um, biological valves. And for those of you back of the room, um, that depends on where you live. So United States, we on the left there, I'm not sure if this pointer works. Let's see if I can get it to work, there we go. So here, uh, <laughs> much more biological valves. And China is interesting because it's now beginning to use biological valves, India mainly mechanical valves, but uh, ultimately it's going to have some effect on the cattle population around the world. We do most of our valves, as I mentioned, invasively whenever we can. This is one option, the J incision that um, I started using back in 1995 and then later Toby Cosgrove and Larry Cohn also adopted. And I think it's a very safe and effective way to treat patients as a patient a year after a mini-invasive operation. This was, a, in fact, acute dissection that I did through that incision. So when you start getting into this debate about TAVR versus AVR, the big question is, um, what are the results? And that's going to vary from institution to institution. So for our aortic valves, isolated 0.3% and 2016 no deaths from reoperations, that's the standard that TAVO needs to be compared against, and there's the STS expected. So we do a pretty reasonable job on that. And this is our mortality over the last few years for isolated AVRs and runs at 0.5%. So then you look at TAVAR, and we had in our partner trial, the early partner trial, only a 0.4% uh, mortality. Now, this clearly is a very highly selected group of patients, and that's why we have such a low mortality rate. And you've got to keep that in mind as you look at the various TAVAR trials. Those are very highly selected populations. <coughs> 
Now, our TAVA mortality, if you take it overall, including the commercial patients, has been running between uh, one and two percent. Although last year we didn't have a, we had one death, and that was a 30-day out-of-hospital death. Um, we had no in-hospital deaths in 374 patients. This year we've had one death um, in the TAVA population. So if you look at the minimum invasive approach, well, how does that compare? Well, our mortality rate was 0.5% before the uh, TAVA era. So this included patients with endocarditis, roots, um, and so a pretty broad population and not as highly selected as TAVAs. And it's really only in our hands after the age of 80 that the mortality rate for reoperation started going up. And I think that is an area where there certainly is good evidence now. There are three big trials showing that valve and valve works very well. Well, what about intermediate? So we looked at our data for intermediate at the Cleveland Clinic, less than point, uh, less than four percent, and the mortality rate was in fact lower than the higher risk uh, patients, 0.3 percent. And then if you look at perivalve leak, which is one of the issues with TAVAR, a very low risk of that. So what about TAVAR then? So I was fortunate to be involved right from the beginning with a transapical approach uh, with Edwards and doing the transapical uh, valves. And here's one of our early dog, uh, sorry, this was a pig, pig experiments from, um, 2004, and then as you know, the partner trial, we made the recommendations in 2006 for the randomized trial, and that came out. And there's no doubt about it, this field is going to advance, and we will be seeing more and more root procedures, just as part of full disclosure, I own the patent for aortic root stenting with aortic valve, but so far, nobody's come up with a way to do that. Ultimately, of course, for the interventionalists, this is what they'd love to do, but the cost is a big issue. And just pricing out doing a procedure like this, just in devices, will cost about 100,000. Now, I've had to redo a patient who had everything done like this, except for the uh, aortic root, that's all. And so this is what's happening out there, and that's going to be one of the big challenges. We've just been asked to pay $45,000 for the latest arch stent, and I said, no ways can we afford that. We managed to get it down to considerably less. But this is going to be a challenge for the future. Great innovations, but how do we pay for it? Let me make a couple of comments about the Intermediate Partner 2 trial. As you know, this was a randomized trial with uh, a transapical subgroup, and basically the, there was no significant difference in the outcomes uh, between the two arms. I need to emphasize this because I just read an editorial in a well-known journal that Dave's involved with that said that in the partner to trial, the intermediate risk, there was superiority for TAVA. That was not the case. And th there's a slippery slope when you start talking about that in those terms. Now, it is true the transfemoral arm was not powered for looking at that, but there was a slight significant benefit for the intermediate risk transfemoral arm. Now, one of the things that I have a problem with is the 2A surgical arm compared to the registry for the 3, um, S3 device. And this was a comparison that was published. I, I'm a co-author on it. But what happened was that FDA selected variables that we should use to compare the surgical arm, um, so that was the older group of patients, with the uh, new S3 registry. Left out of those variables were, for example, ejection fraction, which is obviously a critical part. And there were differences when we looked at this. And Gene Blackstone's used machine learning uh, to analyze this and has shown that there's only about a 10% overlap in population if you use every single variable. And so I have pushed back about this, that there were a number of issues with this trial, although it showed superiority with the S3. And secondly, in the Partner 2A trial, we had, did not have a commercial uh, device for the high-risk patients. So either you didn't treat them or you put them in an intermediate-risk trial. And 
and initially FDA asked us to do that. Whereas in the S3 registry, at that stage, we had a commercial device. And so we then could put the very high-risk patients into that group, for example, the patients with dementia. And so that was another issue with outcomes. Now, what's interesting is we've done a recent look at this population out to uh, three years, and the trial, the, the survival is beginning to cross. Even though the patients in the TAVA arm were a better selected group of patients, the survival is beginning to cross at three years. And we'll do a five-year analysis when we get to that point. So if you look at the trials, I would argue that there's high noise in the intermediate area of the trials, and there's not much separation in the two um, outcomes. So what about the low risk? So the partner uh, three trial is STS less than four. Core valve that Dave's involved with is STS less than three. <coughs> This is, comes from our uh, government report on what we're going to do in partner. So uh, aim is uh, 1,200 patients. The trial will only be completed in 2027, but we'll have a check at 2018. Important part of this trial, as you look at it going forwards, is that the comparisons will be mortality and all stroke, all very well, but <coughs> rehospitalization is included in that. And... I've argued against that, but that's part of it. And um, rehospitalization, just by the way we do cardiac surgery, will inevitably be higher in that arm. So, does rehospitalization count the same as mortality or stroke? I'll leave that to think about what your thoughts are. So, the key things about partner three is death, stroke, and readmission. Core valve, I think, is much more fair and balanced. So, it'll be a one year check for safety and then two year death and stroke. So, as you look at these issues, then you have to compare which in your institution uh, has the best outcomes. So I mentioned to you the low risk. We looked at that, and for us, low risk, we have a very low mortality rate, low paravalvular leak rate. What about then in the TV tree trial? What is happening there? Well, if you look at the TVT trial, this is a bit of an older paper. I know the newer ones. The mortality rate overall in the general population is 7%, and the average STS is 7.1, so it tracks that. So partner three, we've been running at STS of about two, so the mortality rate is still going to be 1.5 to 2%. That's my prediction. I, I might be wrong, but um, I think that that's what we're going to see. So once again, the outcomes in your institution are going to be critical as to how you choose your patients for what procedure they get. Certainly at the Cleveland Clinic, for low risk, we will continue to um, put patients into the surgical arm. But because we've got that data set that I showed you, 0.4% for the trial in the partner trials for our TAVA patients, we have the equipoise to enroll in, in that trial. Another thing to remember when you look at these trials is that there are a number of exclusions in the trials, uh, and particularly now the low risk. Peripheral vascular disease is obviously excluded because you don't have access if it's severe. Here for 20%, we do a lot of patients with isolated valves with 20% or less ejection fraction. Endocarditis exclusion, low coronaries, homographs and stentless valves are exclusion, eccentric annulus and bicuspid valves, bulky uh, leaflets. And I can tell you our cardiologists, and you know we have our uh, valve meeting, look very closely about the risks on doing TAVR in their partner uh, three trial because they are very scared of having any deaths. And there have actually been some deaths now in the partner three trial. And if you then look also at the other thing, which really hasn't been emphasized, but was talked a lot about early on, if you look by VARC criteria, partner A, the TAVR failure rate was 20% by VARC uh, uh, standards. And so even though the patients have all these exclusions and then get set up for TAVR, they may not have a successful TAVR. So my prediction would be that there will be a, a zone of overlap and will vary by institution. And we've already looked at that. And, and the spread of outcomes for AVR is much greater than for TAVR. And so depends where the institutions fall on this. <coughs> 
Let me touch on another thing that hasn't really been brought up much. We looked at 13,000 patients who had AVRs and long-term outcome. If we look by allograph, mechanical, pausing, pericardial, there seems to be some separation there. But if you adjust for age, there is no separation. So basically, device does not make much difference as far as outcome. But if you look at the patients above the age of 75, a number that I would recommend you keep in your mind is that at five years, two-thirds of valve patients done open are still alive over the age of 75. And if you look at it from the point of view of um, US life versus survival, the repairs do better, but biological AVR start falling off about six, seven years after procedure. In our hands, when we looked at patients over the age of 80 that had valves at the Cleveland Clinic, they did better than the US population. Now, obviously, there's a selection in that population. But if you look now at TAVR, what's happening there? The mortality rate is not going to be good uh, long term. There's going to be a much higher mortality rate. Why is that happening? So I would submit there a couple of things because I sit on the meetings and I see this. We see patients with coronary artery disease and the cardiologists say, well, we can get the patient through. We're not going to treat the LAD. We can always come back if we need to. Well, you're going to have some patients die because of that. You also have patients who have mitral valve disease, and that's ignored. And just recently, we had a patient who was done at St. Elsewhere, had some mitral valve stenosis. They put an aortic valve because that's the target that's easy to treat, and the patient then came in with severe mitral valve uh, stenosis and a TAVR, and obviously had to have redo surgery. There's a case selection issue. Uh, pacemakers, uh, the General word on the street is it doesn't affect long-term survival, but we do have data that does. So apart from the cost issue that that increases our costs about seven to $10,000, which is now about 10 to 15% of the patients need a pacemaker. Do you want to have a TAVR and a pacemaker long-term? I don't think so. So the um, other aspects of, of, of this are that we're seeing a lot more so-called low flow low gradient AS. Somebody looks at a TEE and says, okay, the valve leaflets are moving very well. Uh, we're not getting a good gradient here. Uh, this is low flow, low gradient. Let's put it at TAVR. One of the things I'd also warn you about, and I know that uh, Columbia, uh, Stanford, and a couple of other institutions have looked at this, is that the Department of Justice, Department of Commerce, etc., are now beginning to audit programs for the TAVRs, use of bicuspid valves, not two surgeons signing off in a case and surgeons not being in the operating room for the procedure. And about a third of TAVR programs in the United States that have been looked at have failed. So let's talk a bit about durability. So we looked at our patients who had TAVR, uh, sorry, uh, AVR with, with the, this is the um, Edwards valve over time, and the two important curves here, and the one is that the younger you are, the greater your failure rate. And if you look on the right, it's not very well shown, but if you are young, you have a much higher failure rate. If you are over the age of 65, the failure rate is not too bad. And if you're over the age of 80, which in the partner trials has been the average age, you basically don't have a problem with long-term failure. And so as long as we in that population, we're fine as far as durability, whether it's open AVR or with TAVR. But as we get into immediate risk, it becomes more of an issue. If you look in the Vivid trial, what was the average age? So this is valve and valve of the durability of those valves was 7 to 11 years. If you look at the paper that's caused a lot of storm, it was a Euro PCR uh, paper uh, with John Webb and Krebia's early data. They used VAR criteria. It's been criticized because this was reports. They did not review the actual echoes in that study. But 50% of valves had failed by seven years. And it's not been published, at least as far as I've seen, although I've talked to John Webb about it and they're trying to get it published. And there's been a lot of concern about the methodology. Fine, publish it, and then let's have a good debate about this whole issue. So 
here's the, the data that at seven years, only 50% of the valves were functioning adequately. Admittedly, an older device. Then there's been the issue of valve thrombosis, 22% in the uh, paper by Macar and 7% for the open AVR. So this happens, we know that. So those are the issues on the open AVR and TAVARs, but let's talk a bit about now repairs. As I mentioned, repairs do better long-term survival than biological AVRs and biological AVRs. This is a population average age of 53, start failing at about six to seven years. That doesn't mean they need surgery immediately, but they start failing. And if you look at tricuspid valves versus bicuspid valves, the bicuspid valves have a higher failure rate historically. If you look at structural valve deterioration in our open population, then as I mentioned, the older patients have a very low risk of failure of valves over time in the lowest curve. One thing that we really haven't published, we've mentioned it in papers, is that we had some evidence that the patients with a higher cholesterol had a higher failure rate. Now, uh, Dave will remember that Larry Cohn wrote a publication also showing that the higher the cholesterol level, uh, the greater the risk of valve failure with biological valves. And we're not, the, the problem with writing and publishing this is it's not prospective you know, randomized trial, there's a whole lot of issues with it. And so uh, we are a bit concerned about publishing it. But the other thing that was very interesting, which was new, was that the higher the gradient at the end of the operation, the greater the risk of failure over time. And that's separate uh, uh, from the whole issue of patient valve mismatch and body size. So the greater you gradient you leave a patient with at the end of the operation, the greater the risk that it will fail. So aortic valve repair and uh, root. Uh, so there are some principles that I believe in as far as whether a procedure is adopted over time. And this applies both to cardiovascular and uh, surgery and aorta and also to uh, the interventional procedures by the cardiologist and, for example, vascular surgery. The procedure has to be relatively easy. And with TAVR, it was quickly adopted because it was easy, and we soon were able to get our mortality rates right down, so it was safe. The hemodynamics were very good, and then the big question is long-term durability. But even with the TAVR realm, you can look at, for example, direct flow, a bit tricky to do. It was safe, good hemodynamics, although it was criticized by their competition for the gradients across it. And they implied that that might have problems with long-term durability. And so that company went bankrupt. So these, if you sort of invent a new device, these are the things that will determine if you have a successful device or not. The other thing to keep in mind, uh, which we haven't touched on, is the mechanical valves. And this is a very good paper by Zellnitz. I realize it's an old paper, but I like turning to it because at 10 years, only 40% of mechanical valves are event-free. And that's another reason why we don't have the perfect solution in young patients when dealing with them. And then, as I mentioned, there's that strong relationship with age and valve failure where there's pericardial or allograft in the biological valves over time. This is the failure rate at 12 years, 12 years after those procedures. So, Increasingly, in the younger population, we do aortic valve repairs. And I'll go through some of the things that I think are important. I apologize if the cardiologists or people don't necessarily uh, get exposed to this. Just as with the mitral valve, you have to look at the entire valve. And for the aortic valve, you have to look at the commissures, the leaflets, the annulus, the sinuses, and the sinotubular junction to get an effective functioning um, aortic valve repair. So for a bicuspid valve, which is the easiest to start off with, we use Cabral sutures, we plicate the incomplete fusion. And for the tricuspid valves, three leafed valves, we do a reimplantation operation. And hopefully at the end, you have a nice Mercedes sign there. Um, and this happens to be uh, one of the uh, basketball players that are operated on who's come to join us at the Cavs. So obviously I'm delighted to have one of my former patients playing for the Cavs and he comes to visit uh, every now and again, did a fundraiser for us recently. 
So a number of um, reimplantations has been growing a lot because we've shown good results with that. And um, as of October, uh, we had 642. We are over 700 patients now for the elective ones, mortality rate 0.17%, slightly higher for the emergencies and the urgent ones. And we've done multiple studies, which I'll cover now on uh, late outcomes. So bicuspid valve repair, what are our results like? So this was just looking at what is the risk of needing another operation if you leave the aorta that's 4.5 centimeters or smaller behind, and as the arrow on the left at the bottom, only 0.2% of those patients needing another intervention over uh, a total of 15 years. So 4.5 is a reasonable cutoff as far as leaving the root. And there are clearly uh, um, benefits from aortic valve repairs and that you avoid a lot of complications related to valve and no anticoagulation. Now, the one thing that I also find very useful is a figure of eight stitch at the commissure. And what I do with that is I hitch up that commissure to a high level, about three to four millimeters above the valve. And then I put a clip on the outside. I use a Gore-Tex suture, so there's a bit of elasticity in it. And that really has helped our outcomes. And I'll come back to the results with that. So there's just a straightforward bicuspid valve repair. But here you see it now with the suspensory sutures there, uh, bringing the commissures to a higher level. He has a patient with remodeling, with cutting away of the non-coronary sinus, and they're sewing that into position. So that's a remodeling for bicuspid valve, which is my preference. This is another operation I've done. I don't know how it's going to hold up long term, but so far it seems to be working with once again, the principle in the bicuspid valves is get those commissures higher. Here's a patient, um, doesn't look like this will play. So this is just a patient I threw in from last week. Uh, bicuspid valve repair, athlete um, and uh, early 40s and um, with uh, severe aortic valve regurgitation. So we repaired him, and just like Dave talks about your apposition area for mitral valve repairs, so also the same principle with aortic valve repairs. You want a lot of apposition of those leaflets, particularly as far as long-term uh, durability. And there you see there's no regurgitation from that valve. And there's the 3D image with, once again, that emphasis on a lot of area of coaptation and approximation of the areas. That just gives you a flexibility. Now, what I did do in this one, and uh, I forgot to put the picture in, I also, I've seen my bicuspid valve repairs fail long-term because the leaflets stretch. So I run a Gore-Tex suture along the edge of that leaflet. So it just takes up some of the strain of that leaflet and try to prevent prolapse over time. So that's another little modification that I find useful. <coughs> so um, it's quite a few years ago now, we looked at 728 bicuspid valve repairs, um, all types of regurg, and um, some of those had aorta procedures at the same time, overall mortality 0.41%. And here's the survival out to 15 years, pretty good. And here's the hazard of death does increase, obviously, with age. What was interesting in this study is that we've always worried about the gradients across a bicuspid valve repair early after surgery, but it does drop over time and then reaches a nadir of about one to two years, and then it starts increasing. So from that point on, you can virtually predict when a patient's going to need a reoperation. So we had 105 reoperations over time in this series, various reasons, and uh, no mortality for the reops, and we did multiple types of repairs uh, and replacements in those patients. The freedom from reoperation for the entire series was about 60% at 15 years and was stable over time. But if you look at our more recent patients, the repair results have been better. Now, obviously, we knew patients we don't have follow-up to 15 years, but uh, we've got evidence that, for example, that suspensory suture is important. So let me just touch on when to operate on the aortic root and the ascending aorta. And we did a study in Marfan patients and showed that there was a percentage, about 15% of patients who dissected at a size less than five centimeters. And we did a similar study in, in bicuspid valve patients with about 12.5% and came up with this formula.
which I think is useful. So you take the cross-sectional area divided by the patient's height, and if that ratio is above 10, then that patient is at greater risk of for dissection. And what that means is that the younger, or not younger, the, the smaller patients will dissect at a smaller size we showed. And so at 4.7 centimeters, if you have, say, let's say a Turner's patient with a bicuspid valve, you're going to operate at a smaller size versus a tall male. And here's just the data adjusted for height. And if you do it by ratio, then the effect of height goes away. So we looked um, at 5,600 uh, patients who had bicuspid valves, and we had a thoracic CT or MRI. So uh, they may have had an echo, but we decided we wanted accurate data. And of those, we had just over 1,000 patients above a size of 4.7 centimeters. I thought that would be a nice cutoff to look at what happens to those patients. Well, 800 patients went to surgery immediately, and then 380 went into surveillance, various sizes that they presented with aortic dissection. And here's the curve. So this is aortic root size and risk of dissection. And about five centimeters, you start seeing an increase in the risk of dissection. There's another paper that's shown a similar result, that after five centimeters in the root, the risk of dissection increases. Now, for the ascending aorta, it's probably about 5.2, 5.3, and then you get this exponential risk of dissection. And when we looked at various parameters to try and decide which is the best for prediction, it turned out the cross-sectional area ratio was the best predictor of the risk of dissection. So what about the 800 aortic uh, or operation patients? So mortality rate was 0.25%. And then in the surveillance patients, obviously, over time, you'd expect them to need uh, surgery. So about 60% of 10 years needed surgery. And the greater the size, the more often they were operated on. So in summary, from that study, 5 centimeters we felt as a cutoff for the sinuses, about 5.2, 5.3 for the ascending. And the risks of surgery are very low when it's prophylactic surgery. And just an example, here's a patient that went to surgery. It happens to be Eric Roselli's patient, but we've all got multiple stories like this. Patient goes in for surgery, and there's a root a dissection. I had a patient just a week ago, similar thing, uh, had presented 10 years ago with so-called left main dissection, and they'd missed the ascending aorta dissection by cuspid valve. We repaired her valve and reimplanted her root, and she did fine. But that is something that's often missed in, the, in these patients. So I'll talk about the reimplantations and some of the principles. What we're trying to do is prevent dissection. This is a patient with Lowe's Dietz. And obviously, there's a limit to what you can do. If this is the kind of valve you see, there's no way you can keep that valve for the patient safely. It's critical that you get very low on the right ventricular outflow tract, so the whole valve is encased in the tube graft. And then we use pledged sutures in the left ventricular outflow tract and tie down the graft that way. As many of you know, I've been criticized for doing that, but um, we have not had, touch wood, a VSD or a mitral valve um, anterior leaflet rupture or anything like that. And I think the pledges are very important for outcome. There's just uh, the pledges in place. There's another picture of the pledges, another picture. And it's important that you go, don't go through the left atrium because if you go through the left atrium or the right atrium or right ventricular outflow tract, you can get terrible bleeding there. And then we tie it down around a Hagar's and then you hopefully have a nice result like that and reimplant the coronaries. We do a lot of patients, obviously, with the Marfan population. We also do uh, Barlow's valve repairs in this population, and there's a band in place on the mitral. So using uh, the Hagar's, we have not ended up with gradients across the valve, and that seems to be fine. And this is our data comparing the three most important repair techniques, and uh, the reimplantations hold up very well as far as survival. And as far as durability of repairs, not much difference between them if you select patients uh, appropriately, but the bicuspid valves do have a higher failure rate. This is compared to the tricuspid valves. One aspect that we also looked at it was the underlying pathology and not much difference with Marfan's versus degeneration and dissection, which was good. 
We then also looked specifically at our Marfan patients and the patients who had remodeling operations had a higher failure rate. So that's why, like others, we've gone away from doing remodeling operations in Marfan patients. And the double repairs um, have held up uh, nicely over time. So connective tissue disorder, just some mention about that. The reimplantations, we had 178 patients, lowest deeds and various other types and uh, various grades of aortic valve regurgitation. And in that group, we had a low risk of other procedures. For example, only 8% had cabbages. And as far as safety, low mortality rate uh, in that group of patients. What about effectiveness in the connective tissue disorder patients? Slightly higher mortality rate over time. Obviously, some patients have aortic dissection. Um, Reoperation rates not quite as good as the general population, but still uh, very good, and various reasons for failure. Interesting, a number of these patients had actually endocarditis, which was surprising. But here's an example of a patient with gut ischemia. We first stented the abdominal aorta, the SMA, and then I put in an elephant trunk for him and did his arch. He actually is an executive at a major healthcare uh, company here in New York. And then we reimplanted his valve and then put those two together and hooked that up. So, as far as reimplantations, it's a very good operation and uh, has very reasonable results in the immediate risk. Let me talk a bit about aortic valve repair. So, we looked at our various repair options. I uh, started off with 1,900 patients for the entire series and 1,100 recent patients various types of repair techniques that we touched on, and the mortality rate for this entire series was just over 1%. Um, and as far as long-term outcomes, uh, the failure rate was about 15% at 20 years. And we found that in the overhaul uh, cohort, if the patient had a cusp repair and root um, procedure, they had a lower failure rate over time. So just like mitral valves that you brace with a band, so with the aortic valve, if you brace it, you have better results. And if you look at the more recent patients, the, the failure rate was much lower, and there's the comparison. So more recently operated patients with the newer techniques, much lower uh, failure rate. And once again, uh, with the patients who had root procedures with cusp procedures, they had a better improvement in injection fraction over time. The recurrence of aortic regurgitation that was severe was less when the root was also braced. And then the patients who had figure eight procedures, they also had a lower risk of recurrence uh, over time on the right there. And so here's just the figures for figure of eight sutures, a much lower risk of recurrence of regurgitation needing operation, and um, similarly with the roots, lower risk of failure. And if you look at the general population, after the initial period of the operation, the long-term survival parallels that of the US population. And so figure of eight is something that I'd advocate for you and also doing more root procedures in this group of patients and then obviously avoid patients with severe AS and some of the other issues. So one of the things we did more recently is we thought, okay, so our reimplantations are doing pretty well in our remodelings, but how does that compare to other root procedures, biological composites, mechanical composites, or allografts? So we looked at just under 1,000 of our patients, and we excluded, obviously, aortic dissection, endocarditis, and emergency operations. The procedures were fairly evenly divided up. And this just shows over time what's been happening uh, in our practice. So biological bentols, we've seen a big increase in those because patients now want that in the belief that they can have valve and valve. And then we've increased, uh, although somewhat plateaued, our valve preserving procedures. And what has gone down markedly is the mechanical valve bentols. And the question is, is that the right decision? Are we doing the right thing for our patients? So overall mortality, 0.73% in this group of patients. There were more reoperations for bleeding with valve sparing and failures. But the composite biological patients had more uh, side effects. Survival was reasonable out of 15 years. 
And here's a survival now by procedure. Note that the mechanical bentols had very good survivals as the valve preserving. The bentol biologics, and these are matched, did not do as well. If you then look at recurrence or regurgitation, um, mechanical and biological bentols did pretty good, but higher risk of uh, failure with the, of the repairs with valve preserving. And then if you look at mean gradients over time, interesting, the bentom biological and mechanicals had a higher risk of gradients over time. And if you look at le left ventricular mass regression and, and by implication the risk of heart failure, the valve preserving had the best outcome as far as that was concerned. And as far as left atrial diameter, also best regression with valve preserving. If you then looked at the 70 reoperations in that group, uh, valve sparing, the big problem was recurrence or regurgitation, composite biologicals uh, the, and mechanicals, endocarditis was a problem, and then with allografts, the problem is deterioration uh, over time. And uh, here's the freedom from first operation, but if you break it down, interesting here, composite mechanical comes up again as a uh, very reasonable operation. And as has been published by Vincent Gott, the risk of stroke long-term is also low in these patients because the knots are probably because of the knots being tied on the outside. So for the person who's not experienced root surgeon, a composite mechanical valve is still a good option in this group of patients. So these operations are a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun doing them and being involved with them. You fly in tight formation. But if you're going to do a lot of root procedures, particularly the reimplantations, you need to have a good bailout plan if things go wrong, uh, you're having a lot of fun. And so um, that's something you need to keep in mind. I think the new discussion is going to be the role of NOAX, and this is something that John's been, had a lot of interest in the mechanical valves, and maybe we'll see a return to mechanical valve use more. So thank you very much for your attention. For those of you who want a t-shirt from us, you notice the calves, uh, we tipped a hat to them and that LeBron is number 23, but we're banking on the Indians this year. So that's this year we did the in, uh, uh, baseball t-shirts rather than basketball. And this is a hot commodity. Uh, so this year we had 7,000 requests for our t-shirts. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, enjoy being with you. Reap, would you like to lead us off, or would you like for me to lead us off, and you'd like to finish? Which one? It's pretty difficult to comment. Uh, I don't think there's much of anything that you haven't covered. <laughs> but, uh, let me just say congratulations on an immense amount of work, and particularly on the follow-up that the Cleveland Clinic has done. I think that's so important, all those graphs that seem to be so effortless. There's so much work that goes into accumulating all that data. Yeah. Uh, and it's truly the sort of information one needs about making decisions. So I really have nothing to add except to say, uh, you know, it's, it's a model that uh, lots of institutions should follow. It's, it's no longer good enough to say, this is how many we did, and almost nobody died. You need to know what happened 10, 15 years later. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Grieb. I uh, really appreciate your comments. And yes, I mean, the big advantage that the big institutions have over the STS database is long-term follow-up. And it comes at, obviously, considerable cost. Dave and I were talking about sponsoring research, and a lot of our philanthropy money goes into following up our patients. And fortunately, when I came back to the clinic in 2001, uh, Gene Blackstone uh, sat down with me and we had a great conversation and Toby uh, supported this and we set up a program that all our, our aorta, aortic valve patients were followed at one year and then three years and five years and ten years. So that's helped with keeping track of our patients. With our cabbage volume, because it's just so huge, we took just a subset of the cabbage patients at the beginning of each year and follow them. We just didn't follow everybody. 
but it is a big expense to follow these patients. And I think we've learned a lot from following our patients long term. Let me ask you a couple of things, then I'll turn it over to everyone else. The first one was about equipoise. You mentioned equipoise and that yeah. you have it for low risk trials. I'm not so sure. I'll challenge sure. you on that. Yeah. Because here's what I, and here's what my own philosophy has been. I have, a lot, I have no problem with an 80 year old who has an STS of two putting them into a randomized trial. I have significant issues with the 73 year old, yeah. or 72 year old that has, um, that needs an ABR. And there were very mixed opinions about whether you take a 72-year-old with an STS of two, do you put them in a trial, do a TAVR or a yeah. AVR? What's your, how do you sort of dissect that out a little bit further? So sure, I mean, those are very good points. And I pushed back initially very hard against uh, the intermediate uh, trial and even more so with the low risk. Uh, but when I saw our data for our trial data and we had a 0.4% mortality rate for patients in the partner trial, and that was all comers, remember, including high risk. And then uh, last year when we had just one death out of 374, then I thought that we have reasonable equipoise to enroll patients. But having said that, in the partner three trial, the average STS is actually two and usually these patients have other issues. Certainly at the clinic, most of them are above the age of 80. And uh, I've been very involved in those patients who get randomized. So I followed very closely. Um, now, the average age uh, that we've uh, reported previously so far in the partner three trial has been 75. That may fluctuate over time. But if you think about the fact that our first trial average age was 83, then 82, and now we're going to be 75. We at least are, are being very cautious that this is not going to be some 50-year-old that we're going to offer to be in the trial. It's still going to be the elderly patient, and usually the ones I see that we've enrolled in the partner uh, three trial, there are other issues. They may have a bit of COPD, a higher renal, creatinine and so uh, they in a sense aren't pure low risk patients they are, are a bit higher that's what i mean your your default for a completely healthy low risk 73 year old is randomization or surgery 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 yeah. the and next min invasive surgery yeah the next question we didn't talk about was anticoagulation strategy so what are you doing with the surgical AVR today. And, you know, we've sort of throwing this around based yeah. on the data coming out of Cedars and other places. Should we go back to anticoagulating every AVR for some period of time and how long? Yeah. So that's a very good point. And as you know, Larry Cohn had a big interest in this whole issue. Do we anticoagulate patients with biological valves? And basically, the thinking on the Edwards valves, and which we have followed, we don't anticoagulate our biological open AVRs. Uh, we give them aspirin. Now, if they have atrial fibrillation, that's a different matter. But we do not put them uh, on anticoagulation, and, and we very much believe that's the right strategy. Uh, obviously, if you do put them in anticoagulation, you've got the issues of potential the pacing wires. You've got the issue of more pleural and pericardial effusions. And then there is one study that was done many years ago, uh, Julie would probably remember it, uh, where they did randomize patients and looked at the outcomes and the incidence of hemorrhage was much higher in the anticoagulated patients. And what was particularly concerning was strokes. And so uh, for that reason, uh, we don't anticoagulate. And it comes up in discussion every now and again, but we have fairly consistently kept to not anticoagulating patients. But you do anticoagulate Talbar patients? Not with Coumadin. Uh, what do you use? So we, we typically put them on aspirin and Plavix. I see. And that's mm -hmm. for six months. Now, we didn't get into the discussion about that. I think that the big difference in the incidence of clot formation on the valves, and you may comment on this, I think for the core valve may be slightly different, but. But if you look at the balloon inflated valve, so Edward's valve, the leaflets got put aside. You now got a Tavar valve in there that has got walls around it. And so you don't get the washing of the leaflets that you get, for example, on the trifecta valve and also the Edward's valve. 
Um, the tronic valve is slightly different because there you've actually got more full cusps since it's a, a pig valve. And I think one of the reasons why we're seeing more clot on the Tavos is that buildup of clot in the sort of stasis areas on the leaflets, whereas with the uh, biological implanted open valves, there's more washing of the leaflets. Let me ask you about indexing aortic dimension. Why, why hasn't that caught on? We all do it. Mm. We open up, we say aorta's 4.6, ah, but he's a big guy, you know. Yeah. I mean, but the guidelines are, not, including the most recent version of the bicuspid guidelines, which are more conservative even than your own data suggests, why, why aren't we yeah. indexing? Why can't the aortic sort of experts all agree we should be indexing? <laughs> A1 yeah, you, you touch on a controversy that I've obviously been very involved with. And as you know, the, the big issue was that we came out with a thoracic aorta disease, AHA, AACC guidelines on timing of surgery and recommended surgery for bicuspid valves at, at five centimeters, essentially. Then the Nishimura uh, paper came out. Uh, he was first author where they said 5.5. And we very strongly disagreed, as you may remember, in fact, at the Chicago valve meeting, Michelana um, made some what I thought was provocative statements, and we had a pretty heated discussion. That's probably why I haven't been invited <laughs> back again. Um, and uh, over the, the fact that, I mean, we see patients with dissection, we see patients we open up who had an aorta of five centimeters, that 5.5 to five point, sorry, five to 5.5 centimeters. And we've had patients die in that category. And so we feel very strongly that those patients should have surgery. So when the Nishimura uh, guideline paper came out, um, Lauren, I called Lauren Hiratska and I said, you know, this is an issue. We've got two ACC, uh, AHA guidelines that contradict each other. And I'll put together our data from the Cleveland Clinic, and that was the stuff I, I showed you with Janoskis. And then I, I showed that to the committee that was brought together to deal with this issue. And that's why we came out with the update, um, which I, I think is reasonable. Um, the one issue that we brought up, and, and this is based on your work, which was uh, the guidelines for mitral valve and patients should go to a center with a less than 1% mortality rate. I recommended that for bicuspid valve surgery or at least 2%, but um, Bob Guyton and backwards and forwards, and basically he was very good at, at bringing us all together to a final document. Um, we settled on 4%, which I think is too high if you're doing prophylactic surgery. But th that was revised, and there is a mention about the indexing. And so we continue to do indexing, and some people have adopted it, some have not. Yeah, probably, I agree. The hardest thing that, that the associations, in particular ACC and HA, are going to have to under get behind is, is that there is a different qualification for a 2A indication than a class 1 indication yeah. in terms of who should do, where you should have that done. You cannot do prophylactic surgery in low volume centers that don't have transparency in their track record. I don't think. I mean, people are afraid to put that in writing, but we're going to have to yeah. get there, don't you think? I, I think so. I think you're entirely right. And I know you, you've been dealing with this on some of the other guidelines that it has to get to the point where when it comes to complex surgery, patients should be done at a center that's very experienced. And we're beginning to see now this obviously with Tavar. Um, the new guidelines uh, for TAVO, I'm sure, will be coming out pretty soon for commentary and then publication. Mm -hmm. And uh, once again, as we've seen from some of the publications from the TVT trial, low volume centers have a high, much higher mortality rate for uh, TAVOs than the high volumes. And so there is a volume outcomes relationship. Now, as I mentioned, we haven't published the data yet, but uh, in the partner trial, the same holds true. So high volume center, low mortality rate for both TAVR and AVR, but there's a much larger spectrum in outcomes by AVR, open AVR. So um, yeah. most centers had very low deaths, but you had some outliers that were significantly higher mortality rate, and especially for open AVRs. Yeah, Lars, my last uh, 
sort of comment and question to you is about um, this aortic valve repair business, which I noticed like all aortic surgeons, you shuffled the deck. I was taking my notes, trying to keep it all straight. <laughs> um, and of course, you, you masterfully handled it as usual, which means that my, we need to know valve, we lump everything in valve repair, but reimplanting normal valves, and you got to it a little bit at the end. I could we were, could need to look at that more carefully. But reimplanting normal valves should have great durability. Yes. Reimplanting abnormal valves or sewing patches in, or once you start doing lots of things to leaflets, particularly calcification, should will not have yeah. as good a result. And but 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 unfortunately, a lot of that literature just puts everything together and shows. Yeah. aortic repair curves that then get marketed as you should have an aortic repair, but it's much more complicated than that, isn't it? And so my question is, within that, you started to get into that. When do you stop doing reimplantation and go to yeah. a, a, a replacement? Yeah, I, I, I apologize. I didn't have time to really concentrate on that. But as usual, Dave, you have great insight into the issue. And I think to be fair to aortic valve repair, we're probably 30 years behind mitral valve repair. But as many reimplantations and as much of aortic valve repairs I do, I'm actually very conservative. And, and I think that's an important, important point to remember. So if I see any calcium, I will not repair the valve, whether it's a bicuspid or a reimplantation. I'm actually very conservative. And then when it comes to the fenestrations for the three leafed valves, which usually is the problem on them, if there are two or three um, or more fenestrations, I will not keep that valve unless it's like a 20-year-old or 25-year-old. And I've explained to them that I still think it's worthwhile at that age to we attempt a repair. And they actually seem to be holding up pretty well. So I, I am very conservative. But the other part uh, of your question is it's all very well to reimplant a normal valve that's functioning and have good results. But what happens in the patients with severe aortic valve regurgitation before you start? And so in the paper that will be coming out in annals on this entire series, we were asked to do a sub-analysis of the patients with three to four plus aortic valve regurgitation before the operation. And it turned out that basically there was not much difference in durability. But once again, um, you've got to select the right operation. If you've got a three leafed valve, the leaflets are stretched apart. You need to bring it all together. That's what the reimplantation operation does. If you've got a bicuspid valve that's leaking, it's a completely different mechanism of competence. And essentially, the bicuspid valve has to be stretched to make it competent. And so you mustn't put a tight reimplantation in there and keep that valve. We just looked at our uh, bicuspid cuspid valve reimplantations, just over a hundred of them. Uh, Tyra and David uh, you know, presented double eight here, so I was asked to comment on that. And Craig and I have talked about this, and Craig Miller has backed off doing reimplantations and bicuspid valves. I've been very conservative in that group of patients. And so I don't think we have the right solution yet for bicuspid valves with big roots because of the whole issue of getting competence with a stretched valve. I mean, let me open it up and see if, who else has a comment. Julie first, then Alan. Uh, Lars, when you're talking about the drop off on TABR survival after years, one thing you didn't mention was, and it's going to be very re relevant for aortic valve repair, is the effect of even mild aortic regurgitation on long term survival, yeah. paravalvular and central valvular. Do you sure. want to comment about that? The, partner results and what they sure. showed? Well, as you know, there was a huge difference in survival. And even the so-called mild uh, regurgitation parallel, the leaks, had a big influence in survival in the partner trial. With uh, the core valve, it wasn't as strong. It was more the moderate and severe. My point about that data was that I believed that the echocardiographers were underestimating the amount of regurgitation with a valve, uh, Edwards valve and inflation. And that's turned out to be the case. The, the degree of regurgitation was underestimated. And that's why there's been attempts to reclassify perivalvular leak and if you then have central leak. So yes, um, very important factor on long-term survival. 
Now with the S3 device, we certainly see much less perivalve leak and now uh, Portico is going to also have a skirt to reduce the amount of re perivalve regurgitation. So I didn't harp on that because that issue is less of an issue than it used to be when we had a lot of perivalve leaks. So uh, to ask uh, Dr. Adams' question in a little bit of a different way, uh, I've been met with some surprise uh, by folks uh, on trileaf valves and type 0 valves. I don't have an age cutoff in the opposite direction where somebody's robust and they're in their 80s, they've got a normal trileaf valve and an aneurysm. Uh, one might argue, well, just cut out the leaflets and put in a composite graft. But uh, my feeling is if you can repair it and it's, it's a functional valve beforehand that doesn't leak, why throw it you know, into the garbage? The second question is, it looks like you're by cuspids, you're making them all 180, 180 rather than the, the 210, 150. Yes. Um, and with that in mind, you have to do a pretty aggressive raffe release. Um, and then yeah. you're starting to maybe to a couple of placating sutures on your conjoined raffe, a few commissural advancements. Is there a certain age when even if the valve's not yeah. calcified, you get into maybe 60, 62, and you're looking down at this and say, I could make this work. But Am I doing the right thing because I'm making their outflow an ellipse? I'm not making it a circle, uh, and it, it's bound to fail earlier in life. And perhaps I can do a composite graph followed by a valve and valve tamper. Yeah, so those are very good questions, Alan. And once again, uh, I am conservative despite the volume of repairs I do. So generally, I will not do a bicuspid valve repair in somebody over the age of 60. I think a biological valve is then a better option including a biological composite, uh, which is unfortunately in many ways the way a lot of people want to go, and with the idea of valve and valve. And I mentioned the three trials, but essentially they're all congruent, that the mortality rate for valve and valve is about 2% um, in the big TAVR, so look backs on that. Um, now, I don't know what your results are for reoperations. Our risk of reoperation death is lower than that. So we still do a lot of reoperations, but I've heard Mayo Clinic is not doing many reoperations now for failed valves. And then as far as three leafleted valves, I have done patients in their late 70s with reimplantation. It's usually been because the patients really uh, want that. Uh, but I'm pretty confident when I go into an operation, uh, I will <coughs> give patients an estimate of the likelihood I can repair a valve for a three leafed valve, as long as it's no more than about three plus aortic valve regurgitation. I'll tell them 95% of the time I can keep the valve for them and re implant it. For bicuspid valves, I usually give about a 70% likelihood. Uh, so, once again, I, I am on the conservative side, and I, I fully agree with your point that in the elderly patient, you're just better off putting in a biological composite. Even though I'm moderate, I'm even more conservative in that particular arena. I agree with you. <laughs> the older you get, the more a, a biological route is pretty hard to beat, as you showed with your yeah. isolated. But I, I, think, data. I think we need to start <laughs> rethinking the whole issue of mechanical composites, especially if you're in a center that doesn't do many root procedures, then that is a good option and has good long-term results. John? Lawrence, terrific uh, presentation as always. Thank you for being uh, here with us. Sorry, we're not doing composite roots off pump yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> um, with a robot under the arm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in Europe, we're seeing more and more TAVR in very young patients. Yes. Uh, and worldwide, we're seeing more biological valves in younger patients yeah. than ever before. Mm -hmm. All of these are predicated on the notion of a planned valve in valve. Yes. We know valve in valve is producing higher gradients than initially were anticipated. Sure. And we know residual gradients uh, portend a, a diminished life expectancy in primary valve replacements. Yeah. What's the future of valve in valve? How young? Is it, you know, what are you thinking now about the age of a patient, the size of the annulus, mm -hmm. how are you strategizing for that 55-year-old executive that doesn't want to take cumin because he loves skydiving? Yeah. And he needs an aortic valve replacement. Well, those are, are, are all very good questions, and those are tough clinical problems that we face, you know, virtually day to day. And first of all, I think we're on a slippery slope now, um, just like Germany, where the the government started paying more for TAVR, and CMS and its wisdom did the same here, despite some of us warning them about that. 
And so we on the slippery slope, as I mentioned, if you see a lot of calcium on the valve, it's low flow, low gradient, let's put in a valve. Oh, the patient's asymptomatic, but this is a low risk procedure. It's not really, if you look at the TVT data, let's just put in a valve, especially in low volume centers. And then, yes, you're now seeing the argument that uh, heart failure patients with moderate AS now should get it. There's an asymptomatic trial that you know, has been talked about. And so I think we are going to unfortunately go through a phase just like we did with PCI and the management of these patients. And then the young patients and getting TAVR, um, that is a big concern. Now, some of them are arguing, well, I'll have a TAVR now, and then if I need a reoperation, I can always have that or a valve and valve, and you know, maybe I can get through you know, two uh, uh, valve and valves before I have to have surgery, and then you know, I'll take my chances. I think we're going into a, a difficult time when people start going outside uh, the required guidelines for Tavon. And one of the things that um, CMS has been looking at in the audits is off-label use of the AVRs. And so that may slow it down a bit, but um, you know, just like PCM is a stenosis and the LAD, it has to have a stent. There's calcium in the aortic valve, it needs a Tavon, it concerns me. And, and we see some of the disasters from private practices in our neighborhood. You know, endocarditis and a patient who got a tablet that shouldn't have had it. We've seen a patient with a five a descending aneurysm that got a stent graft put in that by a cardiologist and then got infected, you know, that sort of thing. Now, that group has been investigated by the FBI and so they got busted and one of the cardiologists ended up in prison for 20 years, so, you know, yeah, so. The FBI and so on, they are looking at this much more carefully. Will there be the new subspecialty of aortic surgeon that specializes in removing the valve in valve <laughs> and reconstructing what's left? Yeah, I'm sure you could find somebody who wants a career in that. But, <laughs> you know, it's the same, uh, for example, Sandman in Europe built up a practice of taking out abdominal endovascular grafts that were inappropriately put in. And look, we've already had quite a lot of patients with endocarditis and failed tavos that we've taken out with open surgery. And yes, it's going to happen, but the percentage is maybe 5%. We'll see over time. Yeah, as you, you know, a valve and valve tavo is actually a very easy procedure as long as you've got fermile access. Ackman. <clears throat> so, uh, good question, uh, Spencer. Thanks for being here. Um, first, how do you see the issue of the quality of the aorta and decision making during surgery? Because we have seen few patients, they come for a straightforward AVR. You look at the aorta, it's paper thin aorta, even a normal size aorta. Yeah. And then we even were debating whether to go ahead or, or to do something else. Yeah. The other question I have is if the paravalvular leak natural history in surgical. AVRs is known and it's it's relatively a benign pathology. Why this is not um, echoed in, in the TAVR uh, patients? So when it comes to aorta and what you do during aortic valve replacement, um, I think all of us as part of the partner trials and the core valve trials, operating a lot of geriatric patients uh, learn to operate on very fragile aortas and they often will separate into their layers. It's not really a dissection. But what I would say is um, in a patient with a normal sized aorta, if you start replacing them, you're going to get into trouble. If you try putting in tube grafts, you're going to have more problems than trying to repair a difficult to close aorta. As far as the, the cutoff, so what do you do with, say, a patient who's elderly with an aorta 4.5 to about 4.7, somewhere in that region, or, or younger patients, say 4.3 or something like that? Um, I don't officially talk about this, but I will look at the aorta if it looks thick and strong, and I'll test it with a suture just to feel the strength of the needle. Um, I'll do an aortoplasty, and what I do is an aortoplasty that zigzags down the aorta, and that both shortens the length and narrows the size. And that fortunately has worked out. One of our residents is looking that up now because we've got about 700 patients like that um, to see, uh, you know, how does that hold up long term. 
But on the other hand, if the aorta is dilated and it's thin or feels fragile, then I will go ahead and put in a tube graft. So take us through your incision for, for the zigzag. Um, how, are so, you drawing, how are you doing that? Is, are you making that decision before you put in your aorta, aortic incision? No. Well, to some extent, yes, because on, based on the TE. So if you take your aorta here and you've got your valve here, a nominate artery there, I will put my quadriplegia over here, clamp at the nominate, and I'll make my incision coming from the right over to the left and then down into the non coronary sinus. And then I'll cut that piece off I when see. I sew it together, I'll bring it all together. So you're so taking out a triangle, basically, in the acinary aorta. Yeah, it's probably more like a slice like yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So that shortens the aorta. I don't wrap it. I don't do a Robotech or um, uh, Hiller Lax used to also wrap his patients and talk about this from Los Angeles, but I, I don't do that, and I haven't found that interesting. Yeah, we're always on the fence a lot in these elderly, you know, sort of 4.5, yeah. Aortas and try and, I must say, I'm just conservative in general, and the older you get, the less you try and do. Meaning, I agree with you, if you start doing a lot of root replacements for 4.7 and 82 year olds, I don't think that I think you're going to hurt more than you help. Exactly. If you exactly. look at enough of them. What's your, um, you guys obviously run a giant program, aortic dissection. I'm always curious how that works in the Cleveland machine where you have 25 yeah. patients on the schedule. Dissection. How long will you let an aortic dissection sit that's diagnosed in an ER with a, with a We never let thing. them sit. We never let them sit. So they take priority as do our heart and lung transplants over other cases. Um, so we uh, bump cases. We don't hold a room, but virtually every day there is a room that's delayed. And, and we have a triage process. Yeah. So if you have to do an emergency and you say got two to four elective cases on your list, um, you have to bump your electives to do your emergency. And so that always takes priority. And so all our uh, type A sections get very rapidly triaged and they will often not touch our ICU. They will come straight from uh, ER or EMS if they transferred, for example, by helicopter straight to the operating room. If we're unsure about the diagnosis, we do a TEE before we open the chest and then just go ahead and, and take care of the problem. So um, it's a pretty rapid transfer into the OR. Yeah, and if I understood your data, my last question was about sinus diameter versus a and aorta diameter. And it sounds like you can be a bit more conservative at the sinus level. Um, I, did I read that right? Other way around. So, other way around. Yeah. So. If your aorta is um, five centimeters in the sinus, then that's more of a reason in a bicuspid valve to operate on that okay. patient than the ascending aorta, where it's probably the inflection point somewhere of 5.3, maybe 5.4. What about trileaflet? A lot of people come with, they have yeah. one sinus, it's a little bit along. We just saw a patient the other day. They say the root's five, but you know, really one sinus is more dilated, dilated than the other two. So care about we, that. We index it. To, that. We index it uh, to height, and we tend to be a bit more aggressive in three leaflet valves because about half those patients, at least in our practice, have a family history. Yeah. And so with that, we also get genetic testing on those because a lot of those patients will have a asymptomatic, say, Lowe's Dietz. And I go through the process of asking them, have you had dislocations? Have you had hernias? Have you got stretch marks anywhere other than your abdomen? Have you got flat feet, How palate expanders, eyes? And I obviously always look at the uvula. And it's amazing how many of those patients who have a big root have some uvular problem and then you send them off for testing and they've got low SDs. Anybody else? Gabe? Yeah. Last thank question. Uh, thank you for being here. How do you, how do you um, manage patients who are re-ops? Do you use the same aortic diameter if it's a bicuspid or pa yeah, that's patient a, had a previous that's a good question. HDR, mm -hmm. uh, how do you How do you manage those patients? So we tend to be a bit more conservative. So if it's a patient, let's say, who's got a mechanical AVR and is now 65 and um, comes in with a auto 5.3, 5.4, uh, 
I'll talk to them, and they are obviously to some extent protected by the fact that they've got scar tissue they aorta. And as much as people think most patients with enlarged aortas, they rupture and they die from the rupture, it's really not that. It's the dissection and the transudate and the myocardial protection, the tamponade that causes the death. So they are protected to some extent. And if they've had some problems, say, with a mechanical valve and Coumadin, then I'll reoperate on them and uh, typically then put in a biological valve. Not always. If they're happy on the Coumadin, then I'll advise them to put in a mechanical valve because I think long-term that's going to be a better solution for them. So that has to be dealt with some subtlety over age and how big it is and how they're doing on, on say, the Coumadin. So we're going to take a couple of minute break. We're going to have some research presentations and a data presentation to Dr. Svensson for those of you that would like to stay around. Yeah, stop watch that. Randy, thank you very much. Lars, thank you. For thank you. Me.